a very good morning to all of you i hope you all can hear me clearly and see my screen it's pleasantly colder in mumbai finally i hope people are enjoying this change in weather at least in mumbai i know that in north it's terribly cold and few of us who are still there must be finding very challenging nevertheless so let's go ahead with today's lecture today i'm going to take up a new topic good morning oliver yes it is colder but for mumbai it is unusually pleasant cold as of yet i have i remember the temperature these days is around 15 degrees celsius but i remember temperature dropping to as low as 8 degrees celsius i think in 2008 it was one of the lowest that i have seen in mumbai hello manu good morning so as i was telling you in the last lecture the last chapter got over i mean whatever topics we have to keep for exam and for our course we have covered in the last course last lecture now ideally i should have taken one lecture on discussing the problems or applications more of applications we have already discussed many applications more of applications on the topics covered in the previous chapter however what we are instead going to do is start with the next chapter immediately come back to the problems later if the time permits do remember that i have already given you the assignments in the canvas app so please follow the deadlines now the reason for the starting the new chapter is that new chapter is on color image processing i want you people to know a bit about it and read at least a few topics in that before your dip projects begin so we would be in a position to start with the dip projects smoothly so we are going to talk about it Don't yeah okay so mm -hmm. let's go ahead so today's class i'm going to talk about an introduction to color image processing we will develop a bit of a foundation which is from physics and slowly into the computational domains of colors so we are going to talk about spectrum of light reflected light especially it's very important then we are going to look into what is an achromatic light and what is a chromatic light primary and secondary colors and chromaticity diagram so these are the topics that going to cover we are going to cover in this and the next class we will start with the color models so as we all know life light life is colorful because the light is colorful however the base light which is the sunlight looks typically white with a slight yellowish tinge to it at least for the major part of the day now newton had discovered long back and explained that if you pass the white light through a prism 
then it splits into its components which are called pure spectrum colors so this band of colors we all know is called spectrum which is for white light the sensation is up to seven colors seven unique different colors now each color is is not a if you look at the spectrum diagrams here although it is drawn very crudely if you look at the spectrum diagrams you will realize that each color blends into the next color very smoothly so the red will blue will bend with green and green will blend in yellow and yellow will blend in orange and red in a very smooth manner largely if you take the spectra of a incandescent bulb or a candle light you would realize it very soon at your home you can do that in fact uh, it's very easy take a plastic scale which has some grooves on it generally most of the plastic scales corn edges work like a prism so if you take a candle light don't take a tube light take a candle light and see the candle light through the plastic scale edges of the plastic scale and you will find the spectrum of light you can use a magnifying glass to magnify it and see the colors merging into each other so it's a continuous band of colors these colors are primarily primarily responsible for us to see the colors in nature most of the colors that we see are reflected light sources for example if you look around in your homes then whatever light you get is reflected from various surfaces in fact human eyes have evolved over the millions of years looking at reflected light in fact the sun was the only source of light for a very very long time of course stars are there they are too weak compared to sun other stars than sun we can ignore it moon is a reflected source of light and sun was so powerful sun is so powerful that you could never look into sun directly so it was ruled out human eyes has evolved to see the reflected light it has not evolved to see the direct light particularly direct light for the long period of time it's only in last say 20 years that we have started looking into lcd and mobile screens and laptop screens for longer duration remember the all these screens are nothing but the light sources they are direct light sources sending it in your eyes so still a very little is known uh, how they might be hurting to human eyes but keeping that apart important thing is that our world is largely seen in reflected light now if a material if a sub object in around you if it reflects all the light then it is seen as white okay so if it has a high reflectance remember <clears throat> reflectance is the amount of light or the percentage of light which is light energy which is reflected from the surface as compared to what is incident so if all the light is reflected then the object looks white but if some of the incident light energy is absorbed okay not all is reflected only limited reflections takes place then it looks colorful then that hue that color dominates in which the reflection is taking place for example if you are if an object looks green like leaves etc then it reflects light primarily in this wavelength band 500 to 570 nanometer range while in the other nanometer range remember the light is from 400 nanometer to roughly around 800 nanometer other energies it absorbs 
so the energies or wavelength it absorbs that color will not be visible the color will be visible will be one which the light will reflect now what is an achromatic light therefore as i said if achromatic means the chroma means color and achromatic means absence of color so as i discussed if light if all the light wavelengths are reflected then the light looks white uh, the other way to look at it is achromatic light is only intensity so you it can be very bright it could be very dark so it's only that component from a strictly physics perspective when we are talking about achromatic then we are talking about something called as something related to the amplitude of the light so if the amplitude is large so if all the wavelengths are reflected and all the wavelengths are large enough then it will look very pure white if the wavelengths are smaller then it would look grayish and if the wavelengths are zero all the wavelengths which are being reflected then it looks black so it talks about intensity like old movies old movies were achromatic or monochromatic sometimes also called as monochromatic it's called in modern day we have defined them as gray levels so dark gray middle gray light gray etc so this is a very famous scene from an old charlie chaplin movie if you have not seen it you must see it the name of the movie is modern times where uh, how industrial revolution have made humans mad after work and money so talks about that if you have seen the movie great if you have not do see it it's available on youtube going ahead chromatic light is light that we are going to talk more because as i said so far in all the topics that we have covered we are only talking about gray levels that is a chromatic light now we are going to talk about chromatic light light how it is different from the others and how to deal with it so wavelength as i said 400 to 700 nanometer approximately range remember this it is characterized by three parameters radiance luminance and the brightness so brightness is one aspect which deals with achromatism as well when there is no color still there will be brightness okay but here there is a radiance radiance primarily deals with the source of light it's amount of energy that a source will emit per unit time per unit area whatever luminance is about perception of light for example a lot of energy a source can emit in infrared or ultraviolet region but that will not be per perceived by humans so that is the case here yeah here it is so radiance is the total amount of energy that flows from the light source so the, the light source is giving some light then it is the radiance it is given in watt joule per second so rate of flow of energy luminance is the measure of the amount of energy that an observer perceives from a light source as i said if the light is emitted in the form of infrared or ultraviolet you may not perceive it so luminance or lumens which is the unit of luminance would be zero and if it is in the visible then it will be very high so again it is something to deal with perception brightness is a subjective descriptor that is practically impossible to measure generally brightness is there is no common scale on brightness all you can do is this is more brighter than the other one it is also called luminance it is also called whiteness in loose sense white is very bright 
black dark gray or black is dull very less bright so this is another word so these three together would actually explain the measures which we are going to use for the light sources as i said this lecture primarily starts from the physics and then takes us towards the computational algorithms for the color images so right now we are talking about the physics component how do we receive light how do we perceive light that is the question so we have light receptors rod and cone cells if you remember in chapter 2 we have that rod and cone cells human eye cross section we have studied we know that the eye retina has been layered with the rods and cone cells the rod cells are primarily responsible for brightness sensation so daytime brightness is just perceived by the rod cells night time the brightness is not there the rod cells report to the brain that the light has reduced there is a if your rod cells gets corrupted by some any chance in a particular human being then what we call that the night blindness sets in that means the person can't see the enough light in the when the surrounding intensity has decreased also as we age the rod cells efficiency drops so for example if you are at a 20 year you will perceive things to be more bright than what you will perceive at 40 years and what you will perceive at 60 years so the rod cells which are sensitive to brightness or luminance or gray levels while the cone cells are sensitive to colors so you can see different colors because of the cone cells their sensitivity i'm going to talk more on this it varies from wavelength to wavelength around 60% of the cone cells are sensitive to red light or red wavelength when i say red remember it's a band it's not a single color single wavelength it's not an abrupt single wavelength 33% of the cone cells are sensitive to green light now if you add the two together then you will find that this becomes 98% so what are the 2% now so 2% of all the cone cells are sensitive to blue light so that is how in general the sensitivity of the cone cells are divided do remember that this is again an experimental data averaging out over large number of individuals so for a given individual it may vary a little bit here and there so that leads us to the discovery or not discovery i would say but standardization of colors in the terms of primary and secondary the industry has standardized the blue color of 435.8 nanometer wavelength as the standard primary color these are my primary color blue green red the particular wavelength of the blue is 435.8 nanometer wavelength of the green is 546.1 nanometer wavelength of the red is 700 nanometer so these three wavelengths are used for all calculation purpose as the primary colors now if you look at the sense absorption how much of each color human eyes absorb then it is not fixed it is it varies so you will find that the the blue color this is a blue band this completely from here to here it will all be blue this is bluish purple this is purplish blue this is blue this is blue green with all these is blue band 
all the colors in the spectrum would look blue to you but which is absorbed maximum is somewhere here 445 nanometer so this is absorbed maximum then similarly this is all green green yellowish green different shades of green would be there blue green green yellowish green etc normally this this is called bluish green in terms of painting is called cold green and uh, yellowish green is normally referred as warm green so even this absorption in human eye for different wavelengths is not the same throughout it increases peaks at around 535 nanometer and then drops similarly for the red orange red the wavelength peaks out at 575 nanometer and again drops further so human eyes absorption for all three colors for all all the range of wavelengths is not the same it varies with wavelength and it shows distinct peaks those peak values can be used to define the primary colors but now you will find that there is some difference here this is 545 nanometer well this is 535 and so on and so uh, sorry 445 nanometer this is 435 so there is some differences now this difference comes primarily because uh, these standards have been established much before than these experimental data has come and these are used for calculation so people have stuck to remain stuck to it but practical data is somewhat looks to be different so going ahead yes we can get our secondary colors if we add the primary colors so if you have use red plus blue you get magenta which is one of the secondary colors cyan if you you will get if you add green and blue and you will get yellow if you add red and green remember these are the primary and secondary colors for projection so if you have a unit tv unit lcd display etc then it uses the primary colors to create the other colors this is how the mixture of light whenever you have light of different colors and if you want to add you have to use the primary color scheme and this is how it looks like so green red blue green and red added gives yellow green and blue added gives sand red and blue added gives magenta all three added white practically white will never look perfect white it will look gray or something so make it white typically you leave some use some other techniques like to make a perfect white you might use some other technique like you start with the white light to begin with that is what happens in our lcd displays the backlit is always white so if you want white then we don't mix the three colors but we let the backlight come through but for other colors we can mix the three however so this is called additive primaries or additive color schemes to produce all the colors there is a subtractive primaries or subtractive or, or secondary color schemes which is used for printing purpose so any printer uses these so it has three tanks or three color tanks magenta cyan and yellow mix the, these two you get red mix these two you will get green and mix these two you will get blue mix all three you will get black typically again most of the printers will not get a perfect black but instead they get a very dark gray muddy black if they use the three so they use a separate pigment for black
So this is an example of LCD panels. If you look at it, LCD panel, your phone panel, for example, just I will suggest a very simple experiment. You don't have to do anything else, but take your phone, keep it on a flat surface. Um, start an app which looks where, which has a white screen. A part of the screen is white. Then put a one drop of water over it. Now with saying, when I say that, I caution you that if the water goes inside the phone, your phone may get destroyed or whatever and it may not be covered under warranty. But nevertheless, if you do it carefully, it can be done. Keep a tissue paper handy so that you can wipe it off immediately. Now if you put one drop of water on your LCD screen, typically the water acts like a lens and it magnifies the pixels and you will see the three RGB pixels array in the LCD panels. So each pixel is composed of three pixels, red, green and blue and they give out light of suitable intensities to mix to create the other colors. That's how the system work. I'm not getting into the details of it. A reverse system works for commercial printing. This is a this is an inkjet printer. Typically an inkjet printer these days comes with color tanks and these color tanks are attached to the printer. You can see that this is magenta, cyan and yellow. They use these three to create different kind of printing outputs. Any color printer, printout that you take, you go to a shop, ask for a color printout, take a flex printing or, or do any printing at home. It is almost always by using these pigments and of course this is the last one which is the black pigment which is kept separately to make the black look really black because that actually decides how good will be the contrast. Now we get into the last part of today's class and that is chromaticity diagram. Chromatic symmetry diagram gives the color spectrum of any display device. So amount, we first talk about something called as tri-stimulus values. The amount of red, green and blue needed to form any particular color are called the tri-stimulus value. Remember, how, as we have just discussed that if you have three primaries, red, blue and green, then you can mix them in suitable proportions and create other colors. Fair enough. But can we apply some mathematical modeling to it? Answer is yes. So the amount by red, green and blue needed to form any particular color are called tri-stimulus value. So, and then that particular color other from the RGB can be specified as trichromatic coefficients. So for example, if some color is using X amount of red. So its red coefficient would be given as amount of red present in that color divided by amount of red plus green plus blue present in the color. This is what it means. Small x is amount of red present or no, no the small x is the red coefficient of the particular color. It is the amount of x divided by amount of red divided by red plus blue plus green. X, capital X represent the amount of red capital Y represent the amount of uh, uh, amount of green and capital Z represent the amount of blue. So similarly I can have a coefficient for yellow. So coefficient of for yellow is y upon x plus y plus z and coefficient for blue is z upon x plus y plus z. For example if it is pure blue, let me take an example. If it is pure blue, pure blue, okay, then obviously it's 
z value is a large i mean this z value and this z value they are going to be same and therefore its z coefficient i mean will be will be going towards a very high value maybe towards 1 but if it is pure blue depending on how much it is you will get a very high z value but if it's a if it does not have if it's pure blue it will not have green or red color if it doesn't have green or red color then y will be 0 and x will be 0 so these two coefficients will be 0 that will represent a blue now even in pure blue there could be intensities a very bright or less bright that will be decided by the z value similarly if it is pure red then it will only have x component and it will not have y and z component. So these two coefficients will be 0. Only this will be there. So that's how you try to standardize. It is obvious that if I add all the three coefficients, then the sum has to be 1 because denominators are same. If you add numerators will also become same and that becomes 1. And then it will be used if two of them are known and third has to be calculated then I can use this and therefore this becomes a very important I can draw a diagram where but wait there's something apart from RGB there's one more term which is often used and which is called the hue saturation and intensity or luminance hue is the dominant we will talk more about this in the next class but let me just give you an introduction hue is the dominant wavelength or color red orange yellow or whatever and saturation is the relative purity that it, how strong the red is if the red is very bright then uh, it is very saturated if the red is not so bright say pink then it is less saturated so this is how the saturation will explain for example lavender which is violet and white a very less saturated violet is lavender and these two together U and saturation are called chromaticity so chromaticity actually involves two set of info that is U and saturation. As I said, I'm going to talk more about this because this topic comes under the color models and there is a hue, saturation, intensity, color models and I'm going to talk mainly that in the next class. But this is how the chromaticity diagram looks like. You, in this diagram, what you do is, of the three color parameters, X, Y and Z, we plot x parameter on the x-axis that is the red component the y parameter on the y-axis that is the green component so two parameters are plotted the third parameter which is the z parameter is actually calculated so let me explain how does it look like suppose i'm on the x-axis and I'm towards this side so I'm at a very high x value now I know that x plus y plus z is equal to 1 if I'm at a very high x that is red value my green and blue will be less in fact towards the end it will be negligible red and green and blue so this end looks as you go towards this end this end dominates with the red color now if you are at the edge it's a pure red color here similarly if you come towards the left side the red value goes on decreasing if you come towards the bottom of this axis y-axis the green value goes on decreasing so x decreases as you come to the left y decreases as you come towards the bottom then what is increasing remember x plus y plus z is equal to 1 
if x and y both are decreasing the z has to increase so the blue color starts dominating so this end looks blue color of the spectrum these are the wavelengths in nanometers so this colors looks blue this corner looks blue now if you go on to this side then remember this is a scale from 0 to 1 0 to 1 so if you go on to this side then you will find that your green has a higher value you are still close to the origin so red has less value most of the colors will be perceived as green because both blue and red are less so this graph actually gives of the three x y and z two values immediately at any point and the third value can be calculated how does the color look like the color look like as it appears on the screen for you so x x is red y is green z is 1 minus x plus y so it can be calculated typically the shape is the tongue shaped i let leave this for you to figure it out why pure colors are at the boundary so whenever you are at the boundary it's only red here in this corner or only green in this corner or only blue in this corner so the pure colors are at the boundary they are fully saturated very strong highest possible x y or z values at any point inside it's a mixture so that is right suppose if I am here for example if I am I am at this point say here so this is a looks white it is it will have some red value how much is the red value let me see around 0.3 I am talking approximately and how much is the green value it is again around 0.3 so red is 0.3 green is 0.3 slightly above 0 0.3, 0 0.33 maybe, 0 0.33 then you can see that 1 minus Z will be or blue will be 1 minus 0 0.33 plus 0 0.33 so if you solve even Z will become 0 0.33 so all three will be of equal strength for this point and it is a white light which is written as daylight normally the white light is a warm light, cool daylight in this diagram equal intensity is somewhere here so that is how it changes the chromaticity for any point it is a mixture of three colors only when you go at the edges then it becomes pure the white point is a point of equal energy which is somewhere here then the chromaticity diagram can be used to fix three points so to form a triangle so I can take a point here take a point here take a point here that is the first approximations many softwares don't use all the colors instead they use some limited number of possible colors so you can always choose your color suppose I I don't want all these greens I want a green which is placed over here I want a blue which is placed here I want a red which is placed here so these are my triangles so it, they will form a triangle so here is the triangle some devices e produce even less number of colors so that colors can be represented somewhat sometimes like this it is called color gamut of a display device so for color gamut is typically much less than all the possible colors in fact that is how companies differentiate between their displays so if you want if you buy a lower end display they will cover less amount of colors if you want buy a higher end display they will cover more amount of color in fact for any professional printer there has to be a good match between all the colors that the display is showing and all the colors that the printer is printing if there is mismatch then whatever the display shows when he is designing a particular object when the printing all the colors will not be transmitted on paper so that becomes an issue and that in those times these kind of chromaticity diagrams become very handy
okay so color gamut is the range of colors displayed by a device so i think we can stop here chromaticity diagrams are useful as i have discussed for color mixing so if you are mixing any three colors to create any colors then you can use this any line on this gives you all the shades of particular color so for example if you have a line from here to here then you can go for different shades of red green and blue what combination it is so all this information can be extracted from chromaticity diagram oh yeah so maybe we can stop this lecture here next lecture i'm going to talk about the color models and how to calculate or how to convert from one set of colors to other set of colors thank you till then we meet on the google meet to discuss anything further and maybe uh, if you have to ask any questions about today's class